Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, Earthlings, wherever you are in the world. I'd like to say a big hello to you all. Thank you for joining us again. So this is TC here. For those that already know me, uh, don't know me, uh, I'm speaking from London. And that's not London back there, by the way. That's some kind of cool uh, background that we've added in to uh, spruce things up a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm really honoured to be uh, uh, hosting another webinar for IT Labs. Um, I'm the IT Labs Chief Talking Officer. And uh, we, we're doing a series of podcasts and webinars uh, to hopefully provide some uh, good, valuable content to uh, our friends, family even uh, and, uh, and and you know and to our own kind of people as well to kind of learn and expand our kind of knowledge so joining us here this gentleman over here to my to my left I don't know about to your to your yourselves is a uh, blackway he's a IT lab CTO uh, a bit like me I because I'm a chief talking officer uh, but I actually just do the talking. Uh, Blagway actually does some real stuff with technology and makes it all happen. I just talk about it. Um, and the subject of today's webinar is how blockchain can unify the chains in the supply chain. So Blagway um, is going to do a presentation. And then uh, once the presentation's been done, we're going to have a Q&A session. And um, so Blagway, do you want to say anything before we start? Yeah, I hope that uh, we will you're, get... You're on mute. Can you hear me? No, still on mute. What about now? Can you hear ah, me? Ah, there you go. I can hear you now, loud and clear. <laughs> Great, sorry for that. So okay. I hope that uh, everybody will enjoy the presentation and uh, let's have uh, let's kick it off and have a great set of questions to answer. Brilliant, okay. So uh, let's get the uh, presentation up. There we go. Oh, I think we're having a, a, a technical issue here. One second, just hold, hold your... Can, can people hear sound out there? Okay, there's no sound. Give me a second. Uh, I'm just going to try something. Let me go on pause. It's typical. We've been testing this and we've been ready for it. And uh, as we start, it uh, does one on us. Uh, one second. Okay, so let's try again. Let's try again. Hi there, thanks for joining. Today we are going to talk about supply chain. First, we are going to see what the actual supply chain is and what application and tools the companies are using to share information between them. Next, we are going to see what technologies we can utilize in order for an application to increase the sharing of information between the companies. Let me introduce myself. My name is Vlago Yanev and I'm CTO of Labs. With 15 plus years of hands-on experience, I have been involved in many different sets of projects and technologies. When we are talking about supply chain processes and integrations, one industry is of a particular interest. This is the automotive industry. They have perfected their processes so that other industries are trying to replicate and adapt them. Even we, as the software engineers, are using the benefits from their experience. We are using the Kanban in our daily life. We are trying to be more lean and to deliver the items just in time. But let's take a look at the toy industry and its specifics. First thing that is really challenging is the huge demand spikes for the holidays. 
So naturally, the toy producers are trying to be more lean and deliver the toys to the stores just in time for the holidays. Let's review what will happen if they produce the toys in the beginning of the year. In this case, they will have finished product and they need to store it before it is distributed to the uh, stores later, meaning that uh, they have to pay to the warehouses to store a product, leading to decreasing their product income. Another challenge is that the toys are really short-lived. From the toy idea inception to making a prototype, producing the toy to the end of the manufacture, the whole life cycle is less than two years. And it's really hard to predict will some toy be a success or not. In order to find a solution, we need to understand what supply chain is. Supply chain consists of all of the steps involved in getting a product from the raw materials into the hands of the customer. Typically, the supply chain begins with vendors or suppliers. These are the businesses that provide raw materials. Next in the supply chain is manufacturing. This is the process of converting raw materials into products that are ready to sell. The final step is the distribution, which can involve multiple different intermediaries. Some of these intermediaries could be retailers, distributors, or even the internet before the consumers buy the product. At first glimpse, creating a product looks like a straightforward process. You have the suppliers who are supplying the materials, next factories are creating the products, and then you have the distributors and other channels selling directly to customers. What all of these businesses are trying to accomplish is to add value to the complete product. The main reason as to why they are trying to add value is that the value is directly related to how much revenue they are acquiring. If you are adding more value to the product, that means that you are getting a more significant piece of the pie. This is the percentage of the price for which the product is being sold. Just for comparison, based on IBM statistical data, they as a company are adding just under 35% product value. The remaining value comes from their suppliers, vendors and other social companies. Ok, that kind of makes sense, right? But it's not that simple. The real view of product producing it involves a complex network of suppliers, vendors, manufacturers and other actors working together to complete it. Every company that is involved in producing a product is trying to add more value so they can increase their revenues. When we are looking at the network of involved companies to get the complete product to the shelves, they need to communicate with each other effectively. They need to organize and coordinate. With all of the complex processes arises the need for one of them whether that is a supplier, manufacturer or a distributor to dominate the supply chain and lead the supply chain integration effort. The process of supply chain integration has four stages of integration between those companies. The first level of integration is to increase the trust level when they are communicating with each other and seeing each other as vital links in the supply chain, often leading to longer commitments with preferred partners. The next thing is to exchange information between the companies. This means that they are going to share data about inventory, on how their processes are going, what are the delivery dates, up-to-date knowledge of the demand forecast, capacity utilization, production schedules, etc. All of this is to help supply chain partners improve their performance. The third level is to manage the whole process as one rather than independent functions. It leverages the complete competencies, automates information exchange, governs change management processes, incentive systems, eliminates unproductive activities, improving forecasting, reducing inventory levels, and all in all to cut cycle times. The last one is the complete transformation of the whole supply chain so that they are so in sync that they are exchanging critical ideas and they are delivering customer values in new ways. With each inter increasing integration level, all of involved parties in the supply chain are getting more in sync, enabling them to produce their parts just in time for the next one in line. Tools are essential for the process. ERP solutions and warehouse management tools like SAP, Oracle, Microsoft Dynamics are most commonly used, but there are a lot of other tools that help in supply chain integration. Shipping status tools are providing timely information on shipping. To cut down on warehouse space, inventory costs and the general storage of supply chain materials, 
Lean inventory tools come in handy. The idea is that companies can only order what they need immediately. Bid and spend tools are another major area that helps companies to dig down and take a granular look at what they are spending on each item in the supply chain. Collaboration portals can eliminate different kinds of challenges like communication issues, bottlenecks in ordering, filling out documentation, etc. Compliance and audit tools help to maintain compliance standards that depending on the industry, the company is obliged to follow. Just by looking at this slide, I bet you recognize that you have worked on software that is being utilized in supply chain without even knowing it. Let's do a role-based game right now. Let's try to put ourselves in the shoes of the architect who is trying to design or better redesign the software that would be used by the company that is leading the supply chain integration effort. One crucial piece of information before jumping into the architectural view of the software is that in 2017, only around 60% of the companies that were part of the supply chain were using online solutions, and from them, 38% were using software as a service. With that notion, let's assume that our starting point is some online software solution, maybe a legacy system. Let's see what it will take to transform the architecture to a point where we are automatically sharing the information between all the parties in the supply chain system. If the company has its own data, the easiest way to share the information is to create some API to be used by the suppliers, vendors, and the distributors. Let's take the entire architecture with all its pros and cons. This simple architecture can be set up very quickly since it requires only minimal programming skills. However, this will lead to creating an unmaintainable monolith. With that in mind, what we can do is to start with small incremental improvements. For the entire architecture, the first thing that comes to mind is to introduce the dependency injection so that at least we can have more testable code. That will help us with confirming that the changes that we are making are right and that we are good to go before we proceed further. Practicing the solid principle will be the best. But even with these changes, we can end up with too many layers, focus on framework instead of the domain, and the database will mainly determine our scalability. The next improvement is to introduce the basic command and query responsibility segregation. This pattern was first described by Greg Young almost 15 years ago. At its heart is the notion that you can use a different model to update information than the model you use to read information. So, what we can try is to separate the read and the write side, meaning that on the left side we are going to work with commands and we are going to update the data there, while on the read side we are going to use the queries so that we can get the result faster, skipping all the other layers and providing it to the UI much faster. But one thing that we should be all aware of is that the write and the read side models still needs to be in sync. What this means is that we are still going to do a transactional call to write the data in both databases. At least we are getting the benefits of speeding the read side, but we still need to make improvements on the write side. In order to improve the write side, we can move forward with domain-driven design and getting the read database to be updated asynchronously. We can create smaller, bounded contexts, domain chunks, gradually leading to the introduction of microservices. To keep all the services up to date with the changes, we can utilize the command bus to share the incoming changes so that different microservices can act upon them. Changes that has resulted from those updates can be shared as domain events and forwarded as messages on the event bus. We are also introducing a new component, the event handler. This component will transform the incoming domain events to the read model and store that to the read database. The main benefit of these changes for our company is that we can scale up or down the services independently. One key component for any business is the history, what has led us to the current state. In the most traditional way, the relational databases are keeping only the latest data. The history that has led us to the current state is crucial for us, since 
It's an evil traceability and compliance. It drives input for data analysis and it allows us to time travel to the state of the system at a given point in time, if there's ever the need to do that. Introducing Event Store as our single source of truth can enable us to do projections backward in history, but even further, we can do our forecasts for what's needed in the future. Our leading company can do the data analysis utilizing the Event Store data and predict the exact products that are going to be a hit this year. Share the data with other companies, we can use smart contracts in a decentralized ledger. These are one of the key components of blockchain. In comparison, smart contracts and microservices are really similar. The reason for their similarity is that they are meant to be self-sustained, to work off-chain, so that they encapsulate only the data and communicate with outside systems through events. Similar to microservices, the smart contracts work best if they are deployed on a decentralized network. On the network, we can scale them up or down as needed so that all of the events or anything that is happening inside of our system can be processed correctly. In order to communicate back with our existing application, we need a new component, the event sync. This component will read what has happened on the blockchain as an event and transform that to the domain event that the existing software can handle. So, using the decentralized network, we can share the data with the appropriate companies that we want. Here is a quick summary of what the main advantages between blockchain and event sourcing are. Event sourcing is all about keeping the history the history of what has led us to the current state. It's what the business needs to do the data analysis. Blockchain, on the other hand, is all about the decentralized consensus, meaning that it's all about sharing the data. And there are a lot of involved third parties who don't trust each other, but they do trust the system. Event sourcing is meant to be used inside one application, while blockchain is cross-organizational by design. The main advantage for event sourcing is that when we are writing the data, we can expect the lack of milliseconds at most, while on the blockchains, we may have to wait for minutes or hours for a particular transaction to be accepted by all nodes. While there are some workarounds for that, if we are using some blockchains like Hyperledger or similar, we still have to keep an eye on this. Event sourcing Although it may involve a master slave architecture or introduce a replicas behind different nodes, we are still using one centralized place where we are posting our data. Blockchain, by design, all of the nodes have their own copy of the data. So what we can do in order to get to the point where we are helping our leading company to grow and exchange information with their suppliers or distribution network is to utilize blockchain or a decentralized ledger as a technology. Let's see what the next steps are. As for Deloitte's research on continuous interconnected supply chain, there are some factors to take into consideration when we are looking for the ideal supply chain. First of all, the supply chain will allow to share information end-to-end, -end, allowing it to be visible to all interested parties. But in the same time, we need to have controls in place so that we are not oversharing data. For example, when we are talking about having two suppliers that are delivering the materials for us, we don't want to share the pricing information with them. We want to share with them with whom we are working with, what our quantities are, and if we have a third supplier, to if those two cannot fulfill our order and so on. At the same time, we should be hiding the information that is not appropriate for all of them. Using the decentralized ledger, we are having trust since all the company may not trust each other, they are trusting the system. And last but not least, it's a flexibility. As I mentioned, if we have two suppliers, one that can fulfill our order and the second that is declining and or cannot fulfill it completely, we can involve a third party or a third vendor 
who will fulfill the order for us. The ideal supply chain will need to have end-to-end -end visibility, flexibility, inferred trust and control. Only one thing is missing for this to be the completely the ideal solution. That is the link between the real, physical world as we know it and the digital world. RIT can help us with this. With using radio frequencies ID tags and GPS sensors for asset tracking, manufacturers can use these sensors to gain granular data like the temperature at which the item was stored, how long it spent in cargo, or even how long it took to fly off the shelves. Amazon already has a fleet of robots scanning the product QR codes and counting the warehouse inventory or picking up a particular item from the warehouse. We can use the RIT similar to what the smart cities are doing when there is a traffic jam and when they are redirecting the emergencies which is from one route to another. Maybe when there is a traffic jam or the roads are blocked, we can reroute our trucks to go through another path. And furthermore, we can use scheduled or predictive maintenance for our factories. Meaning that we can put sensors on the machines that are being used to make the products. And we can predict when they are going to break and replace those moving parts before they actually break since if we are looking at manufacturing, if something is interrupted, that means that the whole process stops and we are losing money. All of this is why we need RIT to help us to get to a better point and by the way, we are collecting a ton of data. Since we are accumulating a lot of data, we will need to be properly analyzed and model. So it can be used to gain insights and projections of future sales shell space allocation, out-of-stock detection, and improvement in transportation, sourcing, and production. In a nutshell, analyze the process in order to achieve the end goal just in time delivery. Warehousing is widely improved with data from allocation and worker habits, from picking zones and creating environments with workload optimization and automation of stock relocation. Help in production is also visible. Schedules are optimized for energy efficiency, load sizing, statistical quality control, and tolerance optimization for costs and goods. In sourcing, the demand and supply is aggregating data and optimizing the cost drivers by analyzing the data to be upon contract compliance. Imagine how much data is gathered real time from the transportation. Once analyzed, it can be utilized to fit the appropriate consumer patterns. Point of sales are also in line too. Out of stock detection, shelf space optimization, and retail employee scheduling data, once analyzed, will drive to optimizing time and costs. And His Majesty the Consumer. Analysis of payment habits to allow product recommendation optimize the use of credit card bank rolls, return product projections for providers, and even fraud detection. Do you remember the software architect that was redesigning the software for the supply chain integration effort? Well, we can help him. We can use a combination of blockchain, IT, and machine learning to unify the supply chain and really help the leading company to synchronize all involved parties in the supply chain. This will lead to increasing the supply chain integration level to complete transformation. Then, all involved parties can exchange ideas and find new ways to provide value to the consumers, enabling them to produce their supply chain items just in time for the next one in line. The ideal supply chain will need to have end-to-end -end visibility, flexibility, infer trust and control. IT as technology will help with asset tracking, improving vendor relationship, forecasting and inventory, delivering items on time, and preventive maintenance. Machine learning, on the other hand, will help in improving the sourcing, production, warehouse optimization, dynamic transportation, out-of-stock detection, ordering automatically, and predicting the consumer habits. In our solution, 
We can use blockchain to have the continuity and accessibility of information and to increase the trust between the parties, to enable auditability and fraud detection. We will use IT for tracking or linking the physical and digital world. And we are going to use machine learning so that we can get insights and predict the consumer behavior. So the fun part, any questions? Welcome back. Wow, that was fascinating. Um, I've, I've heard a lot about uh, well, supply chains and blockchains and uh, I definitely learned something there. So <clears throat> so we're gonna put uh, Blagway now into the hot seat. Um, do you wanna come in? Blagway? Yeah, I'm here. Ah, cool. Yeah, do you want to turn your, your video on so we can uh, see your uh, your lovely face? <laughs> I think that I'm sharing so. Oh, okay, cool. So, um, so you're ready for the hot seat? I think we've got some questions lined up here already. Um, this first question is: In a supply chain scenario, is there a single owner of the data? or is there multiple owners? How does a blockchain fit into the scenario of owning the data? Who owns it? Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, we have two types of, uh, uh, of blockchains or the centralized ledger. We have the public ones and we have the private, private uh, blockchains. So on the public one, like uh, what we have for Bit Bitcoin, Ethereum and others, all of the transactions and everything that is happening is actually public. So there is no sharing, uh, there is no single owner of the data or anything else uh, like in that fashion. Everybody yes. can actually see all the previous transaction, uh, what was, uh, what has happened and similar. Yes. Uh, for instance, on the Ethereum network, we can have smart contracts uh, and they can have their own data and they can expose only the data that, that they want. But regarding the transactions and uh, transferring of uh, uh, um, currency between the, the other uh, participants in the blockchain, the, those transactions are, are actually public. Right. On the other hand, the private uh, uh, blockchains can actually um, predict uh, who can join them and similar, so in that way, they can actually um, own the data and only a particular companies can have it. Excellent, yeah. It's quite an interesting concept of no one really owning the data. Um, it's, it's kind of s strange. I find that quite a, quite a paradigm shift, you know? Um, <clears throat> so uh, another question that we have, uh, actually I have a question for you. Uh, which I kind of noted down as we were working. I see that you're kind of covering the uh, the toy industry quite a bit in your presentation. What's all that about? <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, I'm a family guy, so I have two kids and I have a lot of friends that are buying to toys for for exchanging converters and so on. Yes. And I have been spending a lot of time just playing with the kids in the toys, so I have yes. to look in the, that industry. and. My boy actually loves Lego. So, do you know oh, what yeah. uh, Lego means? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm. Uh, I'm. I, I grew up. Actually, Lego was the thing that actually brought me towards engineering. You also have technical Lego. I don't know if anybody's used that, but uh, yeah. yeah. And we and we have a massive box of it downstairs. So sometimes me and my daughter play with it. Yeah. So do so you, in term. Sorry, go on. Do you know what uh, Lego actually means in Danish? No, I don't actually. Uh, it, it, if I'm not mistaken. It really translates to play well, which ah. is very well deserved. <laughs> yes, it is. It's pretty, pretty cool. And and in terms of, um, yeah. So in terms of, uh, uh, you know, Lego um, uh, and uh, and and the way it supplies its its kind of distributors and what have you. I guess there's a there's a whole thing around uh, getting getting supplies to the shops, uh, getting uh, the, uh, the resources to actually make it as well. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah, and uh, and I, I have actually looked through their supply chain and it's uh, really huge. And they have factories uh, all over the world. They have factories in Brazil, Brazil. And one of the things that was actually kind of strange when I was doing the, the research for the, the 
toy industry was that uh, they're actually doing the, the Lego is actually doing the packaging in Poland uh, in one of their factories and uh, the instructions and similar are actually packed there, but uh, all of the manufacturing is happening in China, Brazil and other places. Yes. And they're doing the, their materials. So that's why the beat and shipping tools or tracking tools for, for the shipment is uh, pay, playing a huge role in the supply j- chain in, in general. Yeah, I mean, generally public don't know about all this stuff. It's kind of all going on and it's been quite a, a revolution, I guess, in this whole area without people realizing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully they'll be able to watch this video after we've uh, distributed it and they can learn all about it. Um, I have another question here from uh, Erin. Uh, are there any blockchain technologies that you'd recommend for supply chain management? Well, yeah, uh, for, for each particular case, there is uh, uh, um, evaluation of can something be fit there or, or not. So for in the industries, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, one of the huge players in the, in the field are, of course, the hyperledger uh, projects. Yeah. So we have the fabric uh, over there that is being used by uh, huge markets like uh, Walmart, uh, for sharing, uh, for actually tracking the food. There is uh, uh, another one over there, the uh, Hyperledger. So to it uh, is a, a blockchain technology, which is being, uh, they're, they're covering uh, the fish industry from uh, regulating on how the fish is being caught, uh, what are the wow. places, well, is, uh, is it caught on the particular uh, hunting ground or what? The, what's the correct word for, for that? How it's being transferred? What are the sensors? Was it uh, stored in uh, containers? Uh, the temperature? Uh, are there any oscillations so that uh, it's not uh, longer um, po- possibility for any virus uh, contamination or All similar? Right. And so on, till we, we being transported to the manufacturer to, of the fabric, the fabric mm-hmm. where they, it's being. Uh, um, uh, produces a finished product to, to the delivery to Walmart uh, or other supply chain, um, actually retailers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. So uh, I've got another question lined up here from Victoria. Victoria. Okay. Um, and the question is, is that what is the role of employees in this kind of system? What What's changed in terms of people's jobs? I'm not actually understanding the question. Maybe Victoria can help uh, uh, me out with uh, that one. Uh, I guess that the the role of the employees, if we are talking uh, about employees that are part of the manufacturing uh, process, they're not affected in in that uh, uh, way. Mm. Uh, But I'm not sure that I'm understanding the question. Maybe he can rephrase it. Sure. Yes. Well, he had. He does have a, a follow-on question, which is um, um, so. In terms of the current situation we're in, you know, this word that I'm sure people are going to get sick of uh, talking about the coronavirus and COVID nineteen. Is is blockchain playing any kind of role in that? Well, there are some um, initiatives that are going on, at least in the U.S., since uh, they are experimenting with uh, this a lot. And I think that uh, IBM is uh, one of the uh, that goes be behind it and is trying to organize. Uh, and uh, the thing is that uh, um, there are a lot of blockchain or uh, technologies that are being u- utilized in the uh, health industry, where there, there is uh, attempts to share patient data without uh, um, actually exposing any of the private identifiers for for this. And sharing uh, uh, the, that kind of data, uh, ra- like uh, what are the DNA sen- uh, sequencing uh, that can be used, uh, could potentially help uh, wow. uh, lo- laboratories to, to actually conduct their research better to see what the medication are, are working and so mm. on. Yeah. So there is a possibility to share that data through blockchain there is always uh, a possibility to, to use uh, other technologies. It really depends on the use case for, for this. 
Yeah, yeah. And so I find it interesting. Um, in fact, this is one of the things that I noted down during the presentation is that uh, people don't trust each other, uh, but they trust the system, which, which allows you to kind of hand information over without having to. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and if we take take a look uh, uh, at the Bitcoin, which is the the first association, we have uh, decentralized nodes uh, where everybody can uh, has the the history of all, all of the transaction. They can even, if I'm joining the network, I can replay and see. Uh, uh, all, I can replay all events and get to the point where I'm up to date with the, all the changes and. Uh, if uh, any uh, ill participants wants to try to uh, um, change something or fake the data, there are always some mechanisms in, in behind the scenes that uh, is preventing uh, them to do that. Right. Okay. Right. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, hopefully that answers that question. So in terms of, um, here we go, we've got one here. Uh, when should blockchain when should you use blockchain versus standard databases? Because we had a talk last uh, couple of weeks ago by Ilya uh, around databases, um, multi-tenant. Um, wh when should you use normal databases and this? Well, yeah, it really depends on the on the case. But uh, uh, one of the prerequisites is to, in order to use blockchain, is to have a, a shared common da database, to have multiple parties that are are involved. It doesn't make sense to if you uh, one company is owning the data uh, that they are going to utilize blockchain if they are not sharing it with uh, others. Uh, they, that uh, these parties that are, are involved uh, have conflicting uh, incentives or interests between each other, and they, maybe they are not uh, trusting each other, but right. again trusting the the system. Uh, and of course, there there should be some rules uh, on how the, the system should behave and that uh, uh, anybody is actually complying with those rules. Right. And uh, I think that there should be uh, a need for to have uh, an objective uh, immutable log in order to use this uh, technology. Right. And it really, we can talk about specific cases where this is uh, applicable versus where others where it's maybe it's better to actually use a standardized uh, database. Okay, right. Hopefully that answers your question. Oh, oh, we've got a few more here. We're having another tsunami of questions. So, uh, how are you feeling at the moment? Are you oh, feeling good. comfortable? Yeah, good. Is it, you, you, I can tell you're very passionate about the subject and very kind of knowledgeable. So, uh, so it's good. Um, uh, is blockchain only for new products? What about refurbished, repaired, and overhauled products? Does that relate? Um, I guess we can relate that to kind of systems, older systems. Can you yeah. upgrade? Yeah. That's why in the presentation I was actually going through how we can transform an existing uh, legacy project uh, to the point where we can actually utilize uh, blockchain as a technology. Of right. course, there's, uh, we can see blockchain as uh, part of another integration or, and we can use, we can skip back to the part where we are actually listening on events that are happening on blockchain, transforming the, those events into something that our system can understand and can act uh, upon them. Vice versa, we can have uh, uh, events that are happening or uh, actions that are happening in our system uh, to be translated to uh, transactions we can, which can be inserted into the blockchain so that we get to the, the two-way uh, communication between our existing system and uh, the blockchain that we, we are actually picking up. Right, okay, thank you for that. And uh, another question we've got, uh, has any learning from industrial supply chains uh, made it into the services industry? Well, uh, yes, uh, we we have uh, a lot of, uh, there are actually a lot of uh, use cases, uh, for instance, uh, from how the coffee is being produced, from what, uh, what the, uh, from the pl pl plants uh, that they are gathering uh, yeah. till the, the, the complete process and uh, whatnot. So there are a lot of uh, companies that are finding and offering solutions for a particular use case or 
uh, a set of use cases that uh, could be covered by, by any one of them. Right, okay. Uh, there, there were some uh, follow-on questions from that. So, for example, uh, you know, what are the learnings and implications from uh, the industries to things such as banking, especially insurance? Yeah. So, for uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we the first association with the block blockchain is actually Bitcoin, and that is uh, used for for banking. When we are talking about banking, we have uh, one centralized place where that uh, owns the data, and we actually have to trust the bank system that uh, uh, they know that uh, we have spent uh, this much money or whatnot. Yeah. And uh, for for Bitcoin. Uh, why it was successful, we had uh, everybody could, could actually see what are the transactions and everything else. So blockchain is actually used by uh, Bitcoin and other cur currencies uh, that uh, could be exchanged. And for the insurance uh, uh, industry, it's really similar to the health uh, industry. There are a lot of uh, um, um, interests in, the, in this uh, industry since smart contracts that could run on, on Ethereum or some other uh, backlog uh, blockchain uh, ledgers can actually automate the portions of the processes and we can actually look at them as uh, some kind of microservices for which could, could do a particular job, like uh, for me getting uh, car insurance. Yes, okay, thank you for that. Um, here's, here's one from me. So in terms of, I've heard that uh, these kind of blockchains can consume quite a lot of energy um can you speak about that because i find that interesting well yeah the the first thing that uh, is being uh, associated to, for once again for bitcoin is that uh, the energy cons consumption and how hard it is actually to find uh, uh, a number that could fit uh, with all the specifics so that uh, a particular block in, of uh, transactions could be accepted in the blockchain and actually uh, fulfill all of the um, portions for that, that are needed so that it could be accepted. This is the process called uh, mining. And right. uh, this is something that uh, it goes uh, uh, together with the consensus uh, uh, algorithm that, that is being utilized by the blockchain. So uh, Bitcoin and others are actually using the um, uh, the proof of uh, work uh, co consensus where you have to do something uh, and this is actually cryptographic uh, uh, portion of, uh, of all of that uh, and it's finding a number that fits the, in that scenario. It's really hard to find it. That's why we have a lot of uh, uh, power consume, consumption to actually go through all of the cases until yeah. you find one versus uh, uh, it's easy to verify it. But there are a lot. Uh, there are different uh, initiatives to, to actually uh, what, uh, for instance, Ethereum 2.0 is trying to to do is to implement the um, proof of uh, authority, or some other blockchains are are doing just skipping this. For instance, the permission uh, permission based uh, blockchains or private like uh, what the Hyperledger, Fabric, uh, uh, or others are actually doing. Uh, they are actually trying to avoid the, this uh, uh, kind of consensus algorithms just to be energy, uh, energy efficient. Right, okay, so you can tailor it depending on what, what energy yeah. footprint you want to create. Okay, and, um, and from a, I did a podcast the other day with, uh, with one of IT Lab's uh, um, previous clients and, and we talked about math so it kind of brings up the question around algorithms I mean is, it, is there a consensus on the algorithm that's used for blockchains uh, yeah it's really there there are a bunch of them that uh, could be used uh, for for instance the hyperledger foundation of the uh, of uh, those projects could actually exchange one with uh, another so that uh, they can actually use the um, the proof of stake algorithm exchange it with uh, um, with the Byzantine fault tolerant algorithm and so on. So yeah. there's a possibility to actually switch them. Yeah, it, it, just out of interest because I, I love maths, but I'm not very good at it. I, I don't know what it is. I've got a fascination with it. Um, it. Are the algorithms actually really complicated? Are they like kind of reams and reams of kind of sophisticated code and formulas? Yeah. 
Oh, okay. yeah. 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 You have to pick that one to, to actually judge. <laughs> really? You'll have to show me one. I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what that looks like. Um, I've got a question here from Vic. Uh, banks in Switzerland are developing a virtual stock exchange based on blockchain. We're just talking about banks. Do you know anything about this project? I will for sure take a look uh, on that since there are a lot of blockchain uh, um, initiatives that are, uh, that are going on. So Yes, yeah. Yes, I, I, when I was uh, a previous bank I worked for, there was talk of it. There was whispers of it in the in the corridors, but uh, there wasn't that much detail. So they were keeping that under wraps. Um, and I've just told everybody on a webinar, so hopefully people won't work that one out. Um, <laughs> so I, I think um, we've come to the end of uh, the questions that I had here. Most of the other ones have been covered by uh, by your answers. Um, yeah, it's a fascinating subject. I mean, it's mind boggling. I, I, I take it you spend quite a lot of time uh, reading about this and, and, and looking into, into the subject. Yeah, it's a um, passion. So I'm uh, looking through it, trying to experiment uh, with it. And of course, uh, as a company, we have a few projects that are going on that are active in this domain. So that, wow. at least that, that gives uh, some chance. Yeah, really cutting edge, cutting edge. And there I am. Uh, my interests are playing Xbox, so uh, I feel really, I feel really stupid right now. <laughs> Mate, I'm going to do some reading on uh, blockchains and see if I can catch up with you. So um, that's great, and uh, it's it's been great having you. Hopefully, you've kind of felt the uh, the hot seat wasn't too hot, and you felt comfortable in it. You look comfortable. Yeah. It yeah. Was actually quite nice. So. Yeah, it's good. You know, it's just like, like a chat, isn't it? And thank you to the audience for. Um, for all your questions, um, I, I have some more for you. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll try and I'll try and fit into your schedule because I know you're a busy man and what have you. So um, so hopefully that was value to uh, to the audience out there. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, our next webinar, um, which we which we're uh, busy planning. And uh, and of course, please uh, register for uh, the podcast as well, the CTO Confessions podcast series, uh, so you can be updated when a new one appears. Uh, with, uh, we're, we're creating them as we speak. And uh, in the meantime, keep safe, keep well, and continue to look after each other. This is TC Gill, your Chief Talking Officer, signing off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>